you cannot avoid that even your capacitor is perfect. So let's look at the number two in more detail. So number one is pn junction reverse bias, and uh, number three is the off current of those transistor. I think those are uh, uh, very common. Uh, you, know, you, have, you should have learned that in standard device uh, transistor courses. But the number two, this uh, so-called Gido effect, is something unique here. So here, this is another chart for the leakage current mechanism in the offset. I will not go through this again. So basically, the same kind of uh, current pass. And uh, here, I just want to highlight this one. And here in this figure, it becomes number five. It's called Gido. OK. So it's short for drain, oh, sorry, gate. Induced drain leakage, GIDL Gido effect. So this happened at a very high electric field, and also if your transistor had a heavily doped extension area or hollow implantation to make the you you have overlap between the gates to the drain, you have this overlap region, then the Gido effect is uh, significant. So let's understand what is the Gido. And uh, so here we have the cross-section of the MOSFET, and we highlight this uh, overlap region. <coughs> so this region, you know, due to the diffusion of the drain dopants, then you will have this overlap between the drain and the gate. So what happened in this region is that when you have the negative bias, like VGS or VGD, smaller than zero. So basically, if your gate is zero and the drain is VDD, so the VGD in this case is negative. So negative means what? So in the band diagram, uh, along the vertical direction here, if you cut the transistor in this vertical direction, and if you draw the band diagram along that vertical direction, this is what you have here. So this is your gate, and this is your oxide. This is gate oxide. And then this is your silicon substrate. This set is your silicon. <coughs> so the silicon substrate because the gate is negative, I mean, gate to the drain voltage is negative, that means the Fermi level here is uh, <coughs> pulled up with negative voltage <coughs> to the energy diagram means pulling up the Fermi level. So then, this, is, uh, this may be your Fermi level of your substrate. So this is your VGD negative. This 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 voltage difference, let's say this potential difference. So the band is very bent at the surface in this location. Like this this is the conduction band and valence band of the silicon. So what will happen is that if the band is very bent like this, the EV, the valence band edge. If they have, if this valence band edge EV is even higher than the conduction band edge EC here, then that means this electron in the valence band will have higher energy than the conduction band. So this electron may turn off through this silicon band gap from the valence band to the conduction band. So this is called band-to-band -band tunneling, BTBT. So it's from band-to-band. -band. And uh, if this electron turns through, then you will create a hole in the valence band and the electron in the conduction band. So basically, you create this electron hole pair. That means current. And uh, 
this electron hole pair, again, electrons will go to higher potential because your drain is VDD. So electron, electron flows here, and the hole will go to lower potential, and your substrate, if it's ground, the hole will go here. So essentially, electron flow, hole flow, that means what? Current. So you have current. This current is GIDL current, essentially. And uh, you can see this kind of current in the typical IDVG curve. You can measure. This is a ID versus VG, and this is in the log scale, and this is substrate snow. So this is for the NMOS, and this side is for the PMOS. So let's look at NMOS only. So for the NMOS, what we typically show you is here, down to this point. But if you sweep the voltage negative for the NMOS, okay, if you keep sweep the voltage negative, then you will see increase of the current, the drain current. This part is due to the Gido effect. Because in this case, the gate voltage is negative. So the VGD is negative. And then you will have this Gido effect. So this Gido will happen when your gate voltage is much less than the drain or the source. If the source, if it's less than the source, then the source side may also have, have the Gido effect. So this is a major contribution to the D run data retention leakage current. Any questions? We can look at the retention bias mode. You can understand why this will happen. So this is in the d retention mode. And uh, we have the voltage bias like this, typically. For example, in the retention mode, of course, the line will be zero. This is zero. And uh, we discussed bit now will be pre-charged to be half VDD. So this is half VDD. So this is your CS storage node here, storage node here. So if you store one, then you have VDD here, OK? And the other side of the plate is half VDD, for example. So you look at this bias condition. So the, this is G, S, D. Your VGD is negative, right? VG, VG, D is negative. So you have the Gido. So you, you have the Gido current to discharge this node. Of course, you have other mechanisms to discharge this node as well, as we discussed this pin junction to the substrate. You have the leakage here. And also you have the transistors off current anyway. Here. So this is the leakage current to this node. And you can also say that when you store one, this is more problematic here, right? Because this one. VDD, you have this negative VGD, Gido current, and also the reverse pin junction current here. If you store zero, then <laughs> situation will become better, right? If you have zero here, then zero, zero, gate and the drain are the same potential, then you don't have this Gido here. And also for the pin junction to the substrate, no. the, the, the voltage difference is also small. So storing one, will be more problem here. Any questions? <coughs> OK, so this is the uh, DRAN retention. And this is a unique feature for the DRAN. And uh, from the system perspective, the DRAN system spend a lot of effort in the refresh and we call it a refresh overhead. And here is the 
some estimation of the percentage of time spent on the refresh, depending on the capacity of the DRAM chip. <coughs> and uh, 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 you can say that with the increase of capacity, then you need to spend more and more time in the refresh. Simply, you have more cells, then you have to visit each cell every 64 milliseconds. So you need to spend more time to do the refresh. Because when you do the refresh, you cannot do other things. Right? Because at that moment, you need to go to that row and read that row. At that moment, you cannot do other things. So it's, it's a dead or idle, or it's dead time for the, for the system. And also energy will increase. This refresh is not what you intend to have, right? It's useless for your program. Your program doesn't need this refresh, but you have to do this. So it's an overhead for the system. Okay, so next we are going to discuss the DRAM device technology and uh, related to the structure and layout of some fabrication issues. There are two types of the DRAM technology. And the first one is called the trench capacitor cell. So depending on where you put the capacitor, so this one is uh, put the capacitor down to the substrate and uh, dig a trench. So here, this is your transistor. And let's see, it's here. So it's down to the substrate. And then you dig a trench. And then you will fill in the trench with some dielectric. So this is uh, uh, the dielectric for the capacitor. And then you fill in the trench with the electrode material, like doped silicon here. So you have the capacitor here. And uh, here are some images for this kind of trench capacitor cell. And uh, in this kind of a trench capacitor cell, the typical cell area in terms of the F square is like eight F square. We will discuss that in a minute. Why is eight F square? And uh, this is uh, uh, continued as the embedded DRAM in the logic process. For example, IBM is still using this kind of trench capacitor for the embedded DRAM process. But it's no longer available for the standalone DRAM process. No production below 70 nanometer, roughly in like 2005 or 2006. After that, no more trench capacitor cell. So instead, oh, let's still look at this trench capacitor cell. So you will see the challenges for the scanning. So at 7 nanometer load, this is the last generation of the trench capacitor cell. The trench is very, very deep into the substrate here. We say the aspect ratio means the aspect ratio means the height of this trench divided by the diameter of the trench. So it's like 90 to 1 ratio. So it's very deep to the substrate. And once you have this very deep trench, then it's very hard to refill your dielectric or electrode material into this very deep trench due to the fabrication issues. So by the way, a very simple question. Why is the DRAM capacitor always like uh, this kind of very deep cylinder or trench kind of structure. Why is Surface that? area. 
Yeah. Like it's logic mm -hmm. surface area. Yeah, exactly. So so you need uh, the CS value, right, the capacitance for the cell. And uh, if you want to save the area, then you make this trench and use the surface area as your area for the cap, right? You don't consume the lateral footprint on the two-dimensional space because that is your density. So you have to build this very tall trench. Okay, so this is a trench capacitor. And uh, then the industry switched to this uh, stacked capacitor cell. So stacked capacitor cell, this is uh, the schematic of the cross-section. So you have your transistor here. And unlike the trench capacitor, you have the capacitor down to the substrate. This one you stack the capacitor on top. Okay. So that's why it's called stacked. And this is the mainstream technology these days. And this allows to switch to 6F square layouts. And it's adopted by major com companies, Samsung, Micron, Hynix, all of them. So this is uh, the stack capacitor. And uh, we will dis compare the differences in this slide. So this is a stacked one. This is a deep trench one. So the differences, OK. Uh, the actually, the major motivation is the scalability okay, to switch to the stacked one. But the stacked capacitor actually has some disadvantage. Okay. For example, the cell device leakage, the transistor leakage current actually increase with the stacked transistor. This is because of the process temperature. So for the capacitor formation, typically we need to do high temperature leading. And uh, if you do the trench capacitor, this one, the fabrication flow will be <coughs> you build the trench first. You dig the trench in the substrate first. And then you build the transistor afterwards. So the high temperature aluminum will not affect the transistor in the later step. But if you do this stack capacitor case, then you need to fabric the transistor first, and then you stack the capacitor. So during this stack capacitor fabrication step, the high temperature aluminum will degrade the underneath transistors performance, especially the leakage coverage, will increase. So in other words, the deep trench capacitor, this guy, is a fully logic process compatible. So because you uh, build the trench first, and after that, then the fabrication is the same as a logic uh, transistor process. So that's why this one is still used as embedded embedded with the logic chip. Okay. So then fast, uh, the leakage will become larger for the stacked capacitor cell. And meanwhile, the, this means off-current <coughs> increase. At the same time, on-current will increase because the threshold voltage will impact both on and off in the same direction. So the logic compatibility, this one is good, this one is bad. But the benefits for the stacked capacitor are really those. It allows to use the high K dielectric as the dielectric for the capacitor. So you can get higher K value, that means higher capacitance. And uh, the actually bit company noise will become worse. This increase means worse. Okay. We prefer this guy this guy and this guy. And oh sorry. This will also become worse. So the only good thing here is uh, let me circle this. This guy, this one, this one, this one. Okay. For those, those are the benefits for the stacked capacitor. The others are you know, 
disadvantage actually. But still, the industry makes the decision to switch to the stacked cluster. You know what is the most uh, important factor here? The density, the scalability is the key. Okay, we can tolerate some other downgrade of the performance, but the scalability is the key because, as I said, memory industry is cost driven. So, as long as you can make the cells smaller, then they will spend all the efforts to engineer others. Yeah, question. Uh, why can't we use the high key dielectric for the trench capacity? It's very hard to fail that trench. So it's they, very deep. They use AMD or something like that. Yes, yes, but at that time, back in 2005, 2006, AMD is not that mature. Yeah, and then industry already switched to stack capacitor. So, but still, the, the I mean, the key is this scalability to the layout. We will talk about that in a minute because those two have different layouts. Okay, so this is a stack versus trench, and then we will talk about the layout. So, before we talk about the layout, and uh, as you know, the memory array will have the VLANs and bitmaps, and uh, the length of the VLAN or bitmaps actually are limited by some factors. For example, for the bit lengths here, it's limited by the delta V we discussed before, the ratio of the CS over CB. And as you have longer bit length, the CB will go up, and then your delta V will go down. So, and also if your bit length is longer, then you need to spend more current and power for the refresh, because every time you refresh, you need to read the cell. That means you need to charge the bit line. So you need to spend more power. And the word line length is limited by the RC delay. And the RC delay is proportional to the length squared, because the R, the metal interconnect resistance is proportional to the L, and the capacitance Wire capacitance is also proportional to the L. So RC delay will increase as L squared. OK, so let's look at the DRAM array architecture. And this is related to the layout as well. So there are two kinds of architectures. Uh, first one is called the folded bitman architecture. The second one is called open bitman architecture. So let's look at the difference in between. So the first one, let's say here, uh, this diagram, uh, a little bit uh, different than what we use, uh, com commonly see here. So let's assume this is a word line, okay? And then this is a bit line. Let's say the vertical lines are word line and the horizontal lines are bit line. It's a little bit different than we typically, typically see this. And then we put the same sign at the end of the bit line. Okay. So remember that the same sign is a differential input, right? And but the DRAM cell, as you say, one T one C, each cell only connect to one bit line. There's no bit line bar. But your same sign lead bit line bar. So that means what? Your same sign lead to get a bit line from somewhere. So in this folded bit line architecture, the same sign here, let's say have two inputs <coughs> from two bit lines from the DRAM array. But you have to have this kind of twisted cell location. So here, let's say each circle here means one, one T1C, one transistor, one capacitor here. So if you, for this word line, let's say for this word line, if you have cell here, then you cannot have cell here. What is that? Any idea? So this one must be empty space here. 
you cannot put another cell here. Why is that? <coughs> because when you do the sensing, right, you need a bitnam bar. And bitnam bar, as we discussed before, you need that to be half VDD, right? So you cannot sense two cells at the same time, right? If you have a bitnam connect to the one direct cell, your bitnam bar cannot connect to another direct cell. You cannot sense two cells at the same time. Like, where is your reference? So once you enable this word line, you enable this cell, you cannot have direct cell here. So you have to make this empty space. Okay. Then for the second word line, you can have this twisted location. This one to be the different cell location. And then this one has to be empty. Okay. <coughs> so if you do this, okay, you can see the cell area is 8f squared. Why is that? So here, let's say this is the the cell area for one cell, right? Effectively, this is uh, the area one cell occupies. And uh, within this cell, we didn't draw the details of the layout, but from here you can still tell with bit f square, minimal size, because one wire, you know, if you have wire, let's say this wire, really means what? F and the spacing. So let's say F and then another F, right? So one wire means what? 2F. And you have one wire this direction, you have 2F here. Mm -hmm. And this side, you have two Four. wire, 4F, right? 2F times 4F, 8F squared. This is the minimal size you can achieve in this architecture. And this is used for the trench capacitor. So this is not used for the stack? 